What's up everybody? So in today's video, we're going to take a JavaScript developer interview powered by AI. Now the company doing this is called Micro One, and this looks to contain React, Angular, and Vue. I don't know Vue, um, but how hard can it be? Let's see how we do. Hello, I am Micro One's AI interviewer. Welcome, I'm excited to get to know you. Could you briefly introduce yourself? My name is Ryan Lesson. I am a senior software engineer. That's impressive experience, Ryan. Here's a question for you. How would you optimize the performance of a large-scale React application with thousands of components? I would first off make sure that my components are memoized and use pure components so I could stop unnecessary re-renderings using functions such as, excuse me, using callbacks such as use memo and use callback will help us achieve this. As well, on top of this, using large states with use context does cause a lot of unnecessary re-renders, which could cause lots of issues. So that is another way I would handle this. One other way is using lazy loading of components so we don't have to bombard the screen with a bunch of components. What we would do is load them in when they are needed to be shown on the client. Takes a second. Your approach to optimizing performance in a large-scale React application is comprehensive, covering memoization, pure components, and lazy loading. Now, could you discuss how you would manage state in a complex React application to further enhance performance and maintainability. Yeah, sure. I wouldn't use the built-in use context. What I would use is use the Redux uh, NPM package to help manage the uh, complex state. Usually how I kind of slice these states out is usually by page, or we could kind of do it by feature, but mostly I kind of build my store around each kind of page having all the state on it. And how do I decide if state is needed? Um, I really make sure that if this is something very trivial, we could use it as local state. If it's not, we could have it on the store. Also, I like to use side effects for calling APIs and things like that. So to do that, I use a library such as React Sagas or any other library that helps me trigger side effects there. I also make sure to have my Redux um, when I'm dispatching be very declarative. I don't want to have that reactive properties where if I declare an action, there isn't any other triggering of a new action causing that kind of reactive approach and causing, again, going through a chain of basically sending one dispatch and having multiple things happen. Let's see. Thanks for your detailed explanation on state management. Can you discuss how you approach testing in React applications, particularly for components that manage complex state or side effects? Yes, one thing I could do is use a testing library where I could test exactly what the dispatches do by mocking these types of things. So what I could do is having mock dispatch calls happen. And when these mock dispatch calls happen, I could see what type of state is added to the store. Also mocking API calls is to make sure that any side effects or things like that that are asynchronous, we are keeping track of. Other things I would probably do for this would be to use developer tools. There's a couple of packages I could use. One would be looking at the Redux dev tools. That gives me a very, very good look at everything happening with Redux, the store management. And it allows me to go back and forth with using state there. So I'm able to see a lot of different things happening when I'm dispatching actions or the store state is changing. Your approach to testing in React applications, especially with state management and side effects, is thorough and well considered. Could you explain how you would implement code splitting in a React application to improve load times and user experience? Well, it really depends on what I'm loading onto the screen. There's a lot of different ways I could do it. I could do a component-based code splitting. I could do it by um, feature-based, or I could do it by um, which page is there. So normally how I would do this is, well, let me reread the question one sec. Could you explain how you code split? Okay, so normally you don't need to get too complex here. The more complex you get into code splitting, you might actually hurt yourself. 
But what I like to do again is mostly component based. Component based, when you're especially loading the landing page, what we do is use kind of dynamic imports, kind of have the suspense to handle that state that's not loaded yet. So we could show some type of loader or spinner there. And on top of that, the page based is used to deliver a smaller bundle to the client. So instead of that initial um, uh, bundle that I'm sending to the client, I am sending a smaller bundle because those bundles could be optimized to be called later. And we could use different things like hovering to make that load in faster and things like that. So we could cause, uh, excuse me, so we could prevent the user having delays when they're trying to navigate throughout the application. Your approach to implementing code splitting in React is well explained, focusing on component-based and page-based strategies to optimize yep, load yep. times. How do you handle internationalization and localization in your React applications to ensure a seamless user experience across different <laughs> regions? Well, usually what I would do is find the best library. Um, the only library I've really used is um, LingUI here. So what we do here is essentially have this library and declare constants and have the library based on whatever locale the user is specified, we have the library translate all those constants to that language. And anything that needs further translations, for larger companies, you have full localization teams a lot of the time to help you with these translations. But just using basic translations from a library such as LingUI or something similar can help you with most of the basics there. Thank you for explaining your approach to internationalization and localization. Could you discuss how you implement dependency injection in Angular to manage services and enhance application modularity? So could you discuss how you implement dependency injection in Angular? So really all, you, all dependency injection is is that the dependencies are injected into the component at the time that is needed. It's not tightly coupled and practically any dependency could be inputted there. So for Angular, all we're doing is throwing that into the constructor, if I remember how to use Angular correctly. Um, yes, so again, the modularity there is that we aren't dependent on those dependencies. We don't need to know what that dependency is doing. All we need to do, know is when we're calling it, we are passing in that dependency to be called there. Yeah, I haven't touched Angular in a minute. Thank you for explaining dependency injection in Angular. How do you approach the use of Angular's lifecycle hooks to optimize component performance and manage resources effectively? Very similar to React, where we're using pure components here to, again, not have any unnecessary rendering. With Angular um, being a recursive when it's going through the whole digest cycle and going through every component on the way down. Hopefully, Angular still does it. I haven't touched that since, you know, some random version of AngularJS, and it's definitely not up to date. But I'm assuming if that's how it works, the digest set cycle ones, and it kind of recursively comes down. How you manage that is, again, you want to make sure that you're preventing states to happen. I think it's, you know, use some type of encapsulation there to make sure that only when that specific state of that component changes, usually from, um, I don't want to say props because that's React, usually from state passed down from the parent component to the child component through value accessors. Um, that is when we want to actually do those re-renders. And that is how I would start optimizing it using those lifecycle hooks. And lifecycle hooks, um, ng on init um, is one way. Also having ng on destroy to clean up, clean up anything I have there that's um, like an event listener and things like that. View next. View is going to be tough. I've never coded Thank you for view. your detailed explanation on optimizing component performance using Angular's lifecycle hooks. Can you explain how you would implement change detection strategies in Angular to further enhance application performance? Oh, God. Um, I haven't done this in a while. Um, hopefully, this comes to me in the next two seconds of how I used to do this with change detection. Um, essentially, you know, things need to be either in Angular Scope or outside of Angular Scope, maybe, or is that even Angular JS? I'm thinking there. Um, change detection, basically, all we're doing there is making sure when the value changes, we cause a digest cycle to re render all of our components. Um, 
that's essentially it. There's probably other changes to action strategies there to do different things like that. Like for example, only change when maybe the values that are passed into that component changes or things like that. But that's about all I know, because I can't remember. <laughs> I understand your explanation on change detection strategies in Angular. Can you discuss how you optimize the use of observables in Angular applications to enhance data flow and application responsiveness? Mm -hmm. Well, what I first of all, an observable is essentially a stream that we're listening to and we're having that API push to that stream. Um, and then it could push to that stream and we listen to that and then it could um, also push when it closes and things like that. Um, usually what I do here for optimization is using things like RxJS library. They give you a lot of good tools there. Um, God, a lot of these functions name escape me what you could do there, but you could do things like hot and cold observables where essentially you're, are you keeping track of everything that's pushed there even though you're not observing it or you're only getting the data when you're actually observing it. And others are, for example, like replay. Um, but again, it's actually not really observables that are the most useful because there's a subscriber and it, uh, there's, there's two parts of the observable. There's one that pushes to the observable and the one that's actually observing it. And I think it's a subscription or subscriber that actually does both, which I use quite a bit when I used to um, build these observables within Angular. Thank you for your time today. It was a pleasure discussing oh, no your technical questions. experience right, Hopefully I asked them, with answered you. them quick enough to move on. All right, let's see what my results are. Please don't paywall me or anything here. Come on. Damn, junior rating in Angular? That is some BS. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I haven't touched Angular in a hot minute. But honestly, my explanation of it, even though, you know, the whole process might have changed from what I learned. You know, again, I started with AngularJS. But again, React Senior, no surprise. Software skill, excellent. Um, what does that mean? They can't demonstrate a strong command of the English language with, I mean, that's just the English language. What does that even matter? <laughs> uh, anyone could kind of get through these if they could just speak English decently well. But yeah. Demonstrate a strong understanding of React, particularly in optimized performance through memorization, pure components, and lazy loading. Nice, nice. You know what? We're going to go through one more if we can. Let's, uh, ah, that's it. All right, looks like they want us to log in now, so we'll just do that one interview for now. I'll probably tackle a JavaScript one next. Um, I probably should get at least senior level or better. I wonder what the levels are. Is there a level above seniors? If there is, I hope to get it. All right, what do you guys think of this type of AI-powered interview? This is a very innovative way to um, help filter candidates and make sure that you're knowing what's going on there when you push them through to the actual in-person round or that round where you actually have a human there instead of AI conducting the interview. All right, that's it for this video. Let me know what you think in the comments and take care.